Hey, it's me. And I was lied to. And so are you. It's been a tumultuous last few months, to say the least. And I don't know how else to describe what I watched other than sheer disbelief. For those of you who are unaware, a few months ago, some individuals circulated serious accusations against me. And I want to make it perfectly clear right now. They are false. And I have proof. I have the receipts. I know a lot of people have been wondering why I've been silent and why it's taken me three months to say something. Serious allegations need to be taken seriously. I spent this entire time talking to as many people as I could. Lawyers, law experts, officials, anyone. And I wasn't going to do anything until I was certain that it would be safe to talk about. Thankfully, it is. So, here I am. Besides, I saw how the internet responded. Three months ago, I was demonized and dehumanized. People were understandably angry. And the few things I, I did try to post were met with outrage. And a few people who tried to speak out on my behalf were threatened into silence. And they only stopped out of fear. Fear of the internet. And what I'm hoping for now is that at least a few people are willing to listen. I mean, you're here, so thank you for hearing me out. And I've already seen a lot of posts from people telling me to move on or that the tea is cold. I'm sorry that this is no longer entertaining for them, but just because they're bored of it doesn't mean that the harassment stopped or that the story is final and over. What this all came down to was people saying that I was exchanging nudes with fans on Snapchat and Tumblr. And a lot of people want to know if I did any of that. Yeah, I did. And I always made it clear that it was for consenting adults only. This came about when numerous people had asked me about it and wanted to know if it was okay to do. I said, yes, that it would be a safe place for people who wish to express themselves in that way and for me to express myself in that way, it was an open invitation for those who wanted to do it and that I wouldn't be offended or upset and that nothing would be shared or saved without explicit permission. To be clear, it was an open invitation to those who wanted to participate. The choice was always up to them. At no point did I ever go through my followers list and single out individuals or screen names and pursue them. I never did that. I always left the choice up to to them, let them choose to engage or not, to initiate or have nothing at all. I made a conscious effort to treat everyone with the same respect, always. And I see no shame what goes on between consenting adults. It was never meant to be an abuse of power. I never offered anyone anything in return, like making them a Twitch mod or early access to a YouTube video or whatever. I also never threatened anyone, any kind of punishment, if they didn't, or anything like that. However, I want to acknowledge now that there was a power imbalance. That comes down to who I am and what I do. Even if there was nothing offered in return, there was still incentive for people to do it, because I am a YouTuber. It doesn't matter how neutral the intent was, just being in this position causes a power imbalance. And a lot of people saw that and were upset at me for that reason. And to those of you who feel that way, I completely understand how you feel and why you feel that way. And I'm sorry. I feel that what I was doing was not predatory but it was unhealthy. But that isn't the main grievance that everyone has with me. It's the other allegations by these two. They're both named Charlie, which is going to be confusing. So for the one from the UK, I'm going to use his nickname, which is Chai. Their tweets were some serious accusations, and I'll go over them, but they both basically boil down to the same thing. That they were underage, that I knew this, and that I was okay with it and encouraged them to interact with me. I'm going to show you exactly how these accusations are inaccurate or just flat out lies. The key word that they allege is that I did all of this knowingly and intentionally, which is false. For example, if we go to Chai's accusations, we can see that, ah, never mind, he deleted his accusations. 
Well, that's okay, because we can still go to Charlie's Twitter, and we can see that... Well, wait. They deleted theirs, too. This is the equivalent of firing a gun and then trying to hide it while it's still smoking. And for the record, they both deleted their tweets shortly after their narratives were questioned. You know, posted out there just long enough. But that's okay. Like I said, I have the receipts. The most prominent accusation was the first one from Chai. I'm going to make this available for everyone to read, but I'm just going to paraphrase for now. What it claims is that he had sent me nudes while telling me he was only 16, and I said that I was okay with that and continued to spur him on. It's also important to note that he states that he has no evidence of us ever interacting. So all we have to go on is his word. And in an instance such as this, where he has no evidence, my word is just as valid as his. And here's the thing with that. I don't remember ever talking to this person. None of what he claims sounds familiar to my memory at all. The actions he describes doesn't sound like something I would ever do. Nothing in it sounds right or familiar. And through everything that I scoured with any and all possible correspondences that I could have access to, I found nothing with Chai whatsoever. What this leaves us with is his word versus mine, which gets us nowhere. And as the internet has shown me, people are more likely to believe whoever fires first on Twitter. After all, why else would he accuse me unless I'm guilty? So my word is, I don't remember this even happening or even talking to this person. And Chai's word is that all of this did happen. So rather than making it Chai's word versus mine, it should be Chai's word versus Chai's word. In his accusations, Chai sets the time frame for when all of this supposedly happened, early 2016, specifically sometime between March and July. This is all very important. He also makes it clear that this happened sometime before my personal Tumblr account that he supposedly interacted with me on was hacked and deleted. And my Tumblr was hacked. I can confirm that. There are even tweets to timestamp when that happened, which is mid-May 2016. This puts the time frame based on his claims sometime between March 2016 and May 2016. Again, this is all very important. Are you familiar with the website medium.com? It's a website in which people can write articles and blog posts for public viewing. Chai has quite a few of them on there, and a couple of them are relevant to this situation, especially this one, titled, I've been disabled for two years. I'm not going to read every part of it, because not everything in here is pertinent, but I'll make a link available so that if you want, you can read through all of it. The 9th of November 2015 is the most notable date in my life and always will be. Most people remember their wedding day or their 18th birthday or the day someone close to them died. For me, I remember the day of my accident. We were playing basketball. I loved basketball. My height was my downfall. As it turned out, I was running to try and get the ball from someone. I ran, I ran, boom. I fell down hard, landing on my knees and snapping my head forward so that my forehead smacked against the floor. It was almost the end of the lesson, so I asked to be excused to the changing room. The rest of the class came in, and we all started getting changed. That's the last thing I properly remember until about six months later. As we were changing, I apparently fainted, landing hard on the concrete floor and smashing the back of my head off of it. I was taken to a hospital, admitted to the children's ward, given an EEG, an MRI, a cardiogram. I was tentatively told that I had axonal brain damage, and after a couple of days, sent home. Cue another passing out, another hospitalization. I passed out again while in the hospital. At this point in my life, I was sleeping for around 16 to 18 hours per day. I had to stop going to school and was essentially bedbound. Along with the pain came voices, hallucinations. I didn't notice them so much at first or attributed them to being so tired, seeing a spider when there was none or a flash of light. Then things got a bit more intense. Kill someone, stab your mom, grab that steak knife and stick it in his back. I was terrified of myself. All day, every day, I was plagued with thoughts of violence and aggression. They got harder and harder to ignore. Listing your symptoms over and over gets pretty exhausting. Fatigue, severe head pain, spasms of pain, extremely bad short-term memory, big gaps in long-term memory, no concentration, occasionally passing out, psychosis. Cut forwards to August 2016. The psychosis was getting worse. One night, I walked downstairs, opened the living room door, and told my mom that she needed to take me to the hospital because if she didn't, I'd kill her. Literally kill her. The nights I spent in the hospital for psychosis were the worst nights of my life. 
My miracle came a few days into my hospital stay. After about five minutes of terrible, awful, exhausting pain, it stopped. I released my whole body. Something felt different. It was silent. The voices had gone. In his own article, Chai states that he suffered a traumatic brain injury and has no memory for six months from November 2015 up until May 2016. He continued to have hallucinations and psychosis up until August 2016. And if you are not familiar with psychosis, psychosis is an abnormal condition of the mind that results in difficulties determining what is real and what is not. Symptoms may include false beliefs and seeing or hearing things that others do not see or hear, aka hallucinations. To reiterate, Chai's accusation was that the things I supposedly did happened between March 2016 and May 2016. Chai also states that he has no memory during this exact same period and hallucinations continuing until August 2016. My word was that I don't remember ever talking to this person, recognizing them, or finding the behavior that they described as something that I would even do. So, I ask you to draw your own conclusion here. Did this actually happen? There is a possibility to consider that the hospital stay and the memory loss isn't true. That it was made up to garner sympathy. And if that's the case, how can we trust Chai's story about me? And if the hospital stay and memory loss story is true, how can we trust Chai's story about me? Again, I ask you, did his claims actually happen? I'll offer one final piece of conjecture. My Tumblr was hacked. The hacker was seeking to deal as much damage as possible. They were posting really grotesque things, rapid fire. They had full access to my posts, to my inbox, and to my private messages. If they were seeking to deal as much damage as possible, they would have gone through my private conversations and leaked damaging things. But nothing was leaked. Again, I ask you, do you still feel that Chai's claims against me beyond a reasonable doubt actually happened. Something that is important to note is the way Chai and Charlie made their statements. They use a logical fallacy known as poisoning the well. It's a tactic in which before you are presented with information, you are given subtext, opinions, or other irrelevant information to negatively affect your opinion about something before you find out what the something is. In other words, to manipulate you. And it worked on everybody. Charlie's accusations quickly followed Chai's. They had their own story posted to Twitter, and it had very similar claims. That they were underage, that they interacted with me, and that I never even asked them for their age. Charlie was able to back up their accusations by posting several screenshots of our messages onto Twitter. Like I just mentioned, each screenshot is accompanied with them providing subtext and opinions to poison the well before you even look at it. Unlike Chai, I actually do remember talking to Charlie. It seemed familiar, but what they were saying didn't sound right. All of these images and poisoned well tactics that they posted on Twitter are the exact same things that they had emailed out to business associates of mine. I'm going to go more into that in a little bit, but basically they emailed people that I know with these exact same screenshots and said the same things pretty much verbatim as to what they put on Twitter. This is relevant because this is one of the screens they put on Twitter. And this is the exact same screen included in those emails. Only Charlie's Tumblr name isn't redacted. Now, because they have these, it's very clear that Charlie had access to our entire conversation on Tumblr. And they would have been able to see everything. But they still chose to only show carefully selected and carefully cropped images. This was done to make me look as bad as possible and to mislead you. For example, if Charlie would have shown the very start of our messages, you would have seen where Charlie lied. To clear up the immediate confusion as to why my screenshot has a different profile picture for me in it is because I had updated my profile picture sometime in February or March of this year. It's the same profile picture that's over on my Twitch page. All this means is that Charlie had taken the screen caps sometime before I updated my profile picture. Every single part of Charlie's allegations against me hinges on the belief that I didn't know their age and or didn't ask. They even argued that I should have known their age because they used the phrase, I am a baby, as if this somehow denotes how old they generally are, even though it's used in a context of shyness or feeling intimidated. And I did ask their age, and they lied. 
They also clearly knew then that they were doing something they know they shouldn't and is doing something they know I'm not okay with. They had full access to the entire conversation and omitted to all of you that they lied to me, deceiving all of you. They knew about this from the get-go, which is why on Twitter, they immediately began to backpedal on their claims, changing their tone from claiming, I didn't say he knew my age, I said he was predatory. Predatory behavior would be targeting an individual and pursuing after them, often repeatedly. And as Charlie had access to our whole conversation, they saw it was them who continued to initiate conversations with me unprompted numerous times for months along. But Charlie chose to omit that. And when they spoke with the Daily Beast, they lied in the interview about me never asking for their age. When I did, so this is libel, Knobenbauer could have asked for my ID and they could have not lied. This isn't about whether or not they remembered if I asked them or not. It's that they knew that I asked because they clearly had access to all of our messages and saw their truth. Now, this does bring up the question, why didn't I ask for people's IDs? And the answer is because that would be asking people to dox themselves, which seems far more risky. Besides, there's no way to verify IDs, and it's very easy for people to Photoshop up one in minutes. And if someone is going to lie to get somewhere, they're going to lie. By the way, Charlie also would have seen that in our entire conversation, I never sent them a dick pic. So all these beliefs that Jared sent nudes to minors is factually untrue. Even the claims that I was manipulative or coerced them are untrue because I made it consistently clear, as I did with everyone else, that it was their choice if they wanted to every time. More accurately, it was Charlie who manipulated me and all of you with their lies. These allegations against me about being a predator against underage people are fundamentally false. Charlie and Chai began making these accusations against me back at the end of March, beginning of April this year. They were smearing my name back then by sending an email out with everything that you've seen already. And the first people they sent these accusations out to was the Game Grumps. Not the police or law enforcement or the person I was married to at the time, but the Game Grumps. This can be easily proven with a tweet Chai made to Aaron Hansen of the Game Grumps at the end of March about the email. This Twitter account of Chai's was suspended shortly after for harassment. Sometime around April 2nd, the Game Grumps privated every single video they've ever done with me because they believed the poisoned well and didn't ask me about it. The next day, I was shown the email, and honestly, even I believed it. None of it sounded right to me, but if they were saying this, I must have done this, right? It must be true? So, I apologized to them. It upset Charlie and Chai that I got in contact with them and tried to apologize. They called my apology manipulative. Here's the thing. I apologized to them because they wanted me to. Let's go back to the email that they sent out to the Game Grumps. At the very end, Chai and Charlie state in that email that ideally they'd like me to always check the age of the people I'm talking to sexually, which I did, and to apologize to Chai and Charlie. So I did. But now let's look at the email that they sent to Normal Boots a couple of days later. Scroll down to the very same section and... They deleted the part where they wanted me to apologize. They then weaponized my apology against me on Twitter after asking for it. That is literally manipulation. Now when this all broke out publicly, Normal Boots did post a statement that I was no longer a part of their team. I was not fired. I resigned so that everyone else at Normal Boots wouldn't get dragged down with me. I was already seeing the negativity in all of their videos and some of them started losing subscribers. I left in the hopes that they wouldn't take any more additional collateral damage. The last thing I want to note about this email is that Chai and Charlie made it clear that they worked on it together and Charlie lied about their claims. This doesn't automatically disprove Chai, but their close friendship and one of them being a liar does cast further doubt on Chai's claims, especially since he has no evidence. How can we trust Chai when his cohort, Charlie, was already lying? Something I've been trying to figure out through all of this is, why would they even do this? Why make such dishonest claims? And for as much as I have mulled it over, I can only come down to the most logical conclusion, which is also the simplest. Money and attention.
It's very clear that they both adore attention and desired it from the internet and especially from the Game Grumps. Both of them are massive fans of the Grumps. This is really easy to see from Chai having another article on Medium about meeting your idols and talks about meeting the Game Grumps the entire time. Charlie has another Tumblr called Ego Banged, dedicated to sexual fantasies of Dan and Aaron, fan fictions, fan art, and discussions of them having sex with each other, along with Charlie talking about their own sexual experiences, desires, and fantasies, which also contradicts their claim of being inexperienced, innocent, or a baby. Charlie even tweeted at Ross of the Game Grumps about watching a gay porn with an actor who looks just like him in 2015. The grab for attention ultimately proved successful. Both of them got a large influx of new Twitter followers, as even denoted by Charlie, and it was even better for Chai since his previous Twitter account just got suspended. It even got them the attentions of their idols that they adored, and all of this gives them clout and social credits. Credits that give them a degree of having a form of notoriety and believability and admiration for taking down the bad guy. They both were aware of this and tried to capitalize on it. While all the drama was going on, Chai tweeted out links to his Amazon wish list, his PayPal, and to his coffee, and kept it pinned there for weeks. He even tweeted about it again at the end of May. Charlie's pinned tweet, and it's still there, is a link to their commissions page for art. And on this page is a link for donations, which goes straight to their PayPal. This isn't a coincidence. They've both shown a repeated behavior of e-begging. There's a tweet Charlie made to Chai's now suspended Twitter account last year about Chai suddenly becoming famous and how he should link his PayPal. Going back for a moment to Charlie's ego-banged porn blog, they've posted on there asking for commissions in May of 2017, and again the next month, only this time asking for direct donations. This post asking for money got near 1,400 notes, which is huge for Tumblr, all while saying, help me, I'm a baby. This shows that e-begging can be successful. Asking for money or asking for commissions to draw porn. Chai and Charlie were not the only accusations of inappropriate behavior that came out. As all of this was unfolding, Pamela Horton tweeted out her own statements. I will discuss those as well. If you're not familiar with Pamela, she is currently a member of the YouTube channel Toaster Ghost and was formerly a model for Playboy's Gamer Next Door. Her statement alleges that at a Nintendo event in early 2015 that both she and I were attending, I looked up her nudes and forcefully showed them to a group of gentlemen also attending the event. The event she's speaking of was a special preview event for the first Splatoon game when it was going to be released for the Wii U, which is also where Pamela and I first met. This is confirmed by Amelia Talon, a co-worker of Pamela's at Playboy, who I also met there for the first time. When I first saw this, I had no idea what she was talking about. I don't remember doing anything of that sort that entire weekend. Again, this isn't something I would do. It was really confusing considering the numerous occasions after this event that Pamela and I were both at and were very friendly and amicable. I never had any sense of discomfort or disapproval from her, so I had to ask other people what she's even talking about just to find out what she was referring to. This statement was written in such a way as to make it seem as if she was present during the supposed instance and witnessed it, which she was not. She also left out a lot of details so that the story couldn't be verified, such as the gentleman in question. So, I'll name them. Gerard the Completionist, another person who requested to remain anonymous, and Matzo Hinky, formerly of Smosh Games and now of Toaster Ghost. I'm saying I didn't do this. The anonymous person said he doesn't remember me doing this. Gerard said, he doesn't remember me doing this and knows it's not something that I would do. Which leads me to believe that Pamela heard about this from Sohinky. So of the four gentlemen present, three of the four say it didn't happen. I will tell you what I do remember happening. While the four of us gentlemen were hanging out in one of our hotel rooms one of the evenings, somebody had mentioned that Pamela has a Bayonetta cosplay. I believe it was Sohinky who mentioned that, but I'm, I'm, un I'm unsure on that detail. At the time, I had a vested interest in cosplay due to my relationship with a cosplayer. So I remember looking up Pamela's costume. And I remember being audibly excited after I realized I had just seen Pamela as Bayonetta at E3 2014, where she was modeling the costume promoting Bayonetta 2 for the Wii U. I think this whole thing was a misunderstanding or misremembrance. I know what I did not do. I did not scour the internet 
for her nudes and then forcefully show them to a friend of mine and two strangers at the time. But that's not the end of her accusations. She goes on to talk about how I continued to show her disrespect, refusing to shake her hand, and making lewd comments about her and ignoring her in a group setting. Again, these details are vague, and again, I don't know what she's talking about. I had to ask around just to find out what she was even referring to. And what I found out was that she was specifically referring to my behavior at E3 a few years ago during a panel that consisted of myself, Pamela, and MatPat. Here's the thing with that. I've never done a panel with MatPat. I've never done a panel with Pamela. I've never done a panel with MatPat and Pamela together. I've never done a panel at E3. This couldn't have happened because the circumstances in which they did don't exist. And if you don't believe me on that, that's okay. Ask MatPat, a third party there supposedly present when this happened. And if it does exist, please find it. If it was done at E3, it was recorded or live streamed and saved somewhere. Please find it. I would love to see it because I don't know what she's talking about. If it exists, I will gladly eat my words and apologize. But I know that it doesn't. I have to admit here that I don't personally know Pamela that well. We've hung out a few social gatherings while I was in Los Angeles, and we were always cordial with each other. However, I don't believe that Pamela is a liar. I think this is something that probably actually happened to her, and she was treated with some amount of disrespect, but she's putting me in the place of someone who actually treated her this way. I am choosing to believe that she isn't just making stuff up. The outrage and the response of the internet was formed entirely by misinformation and by using false equality, by saying, well, this part is true, therefore, this part must also be true. But people ran with a narrative formed by layers upon layers of accusations without facts. This was perpetuated until it became the truth. But it wasn't the truth. And that didn't matter. It wasn't important if it was true or not. A mob was beating me down, and everyone jumped in on it. Everyone wanted to show that they had the moral high ground by kicking me while I was down. Tweeting memes, clown emojis, and jokes to essentially virtue signal that they are somehow better than me without all the facts, all for the congratulations of anonymous internet strangers. YouTubers that I've never even heard of and who I imagine never heard of me lashed out at me and made jokes at my expense. Some of them harassed me overtly. Others did it subtly. But let's call it what it really is. It's bullying. Imagine them walking down the street and seeing a group of people beating someone down to the ground to the point that he's helpless and immobile. And without even knowing anything of the situation or what the truth even is, they joined in on it just so that they could feel better than the person they were punching down on. What was amazing was seeing the sheer amount of coverage on drama YouTube channels. Dozens of them all weighing in from a supposed neutral stance. Not one of them tried to reach out to me. Not one of them tried to ask me, hey, is any of this true? What's your side of the story? They aren't interested in truth or being fair. They wanted clicks. And because of that, they further perpetuated misinformation and stirred up a mob. I already know people are moving their goalposts so that they can continue to condemn me by saying, oh, well, he's still a cheater. No cheating happened. I told my wife of the time that I no longer wanted to be with her in October of 2018. I was refused. I was told no. I was denied. I had my career threatened. I felt controlled. I sought therapists and lawyers to assist in separating. We tried discernment therapy to no avail. I have texts from that time that show I was refused and that it was just going to be taken as a warning. I have texts between myself and a professional third party well aware of the entire situation that shows I was trying to end it around that time. 
Holly is being called a homewrecker, which is such an antiquated term, and that makes it seem like that I had no power or choice or agency in my own relationship, which is not true. It was my choice to not be in that relationship anymore. And Holly didn't cheat on Ross. Ross knows literally everything. He knew everything was going on with me and Holly. He knew everything that was going on with my personal relationship. Ross even flew up to see me in March of 2018 to support me. He had some other goals that weekend, but he did make it a point to see me, to encourage me, and to support me. And Ross moved out and left Holly while she was away at PAX West last year. So to say that she cheated on him is wholly inaccurate. And quite frankly, none of that should matter. Breakups happen. Sometimes relationships don't work out. And anything to do with that is none of your business. So what about the people who still want to support me? What can you do? Well... It would mean a lot to me if you could watch my YouTube videos again, either on this channel or over, over on the Gameplay channel. Uh, it would mean a lot to me if you would watch my Twitch streams, since I'll probably be there a bit more since it doesn't require as much emotional energy as making YouTube videos. There's a petition to get Dice Camera Action back on the air. If you want to follow that link in the description and sign that, I would really appreciate it. If you want, you can try to help combat all the misinformation that's still being spread around, either by sharing this video or engaging ill-informed people respectfully. And that's not going to be easy. There's going to be a lot of cognitive dissonance and the fear of social exclusion. It's going to be painful for some people, like a gear in their head suddenly going in the opposite direction. Nobody likes hearing that they're wrong. Be kind and be patient. If you would like to do more research on your own to continue being informed, there are a few places that I can point out. The original Progeria subreddit was vandalized to hell and locked down, and the mods removed me from it and are refusing to relinquish control. So the Progeria 2 subreddit has a lot of discussion and additional information. There is a truth blog about the whole ordeal that is trying to make sense of it all. They're doing a, they're doing a pretty good job. They don't have everything, but they're doing a pretty good job. And there are a couple of YouTube videos that are mostly accurate. I'd also like to humbly request to stop harassing me, to don't harass Holly, don't harass Heidi, don't harass my friends, especially those who try to stand up for me, don't harass anybody. I know a lot of people reacted very emotionally to all of this, and they may have said or done things that they now regret. And if this someone is you, I want you to know I forgive you, and I hope that you can forgive me for anything too. And there will still be people who are still angry about it or won't accept the nudes blog thing or whatever, and that's okay. They are allowed to feel how they feel. I'm not going anywhere. I'm still going to be making videos, talking about Final Fantasy or D&D or Magic the Gathering or whatever else that I want. I'll still be streaming. I'll still be doing my thing. I do have one more request. The next time you see someone being canceled with the mob attacking them and going after them, ask, what's the other side's story? Is there more to this? How do you know they deserve to be bullied and shamed through evidence or through public opinion? Nobody likes cancel culture until they get an opportunity to cancel someone.